So good evening, everyone in the audience. Good evening, everyone who's going to be watching online. And good evening to Prajwal Shastri and Geeta Chadda, doctors Prajwal Shastri and Geeta Chadda. Um, welcome to the BIC and thank you for being here. Um, now the bios for both Prajwal and Geeta uh, that indicate that Prajwal is a practicing scientist a physicist, in fact, an astrophysicist. She looks at the stars and other exciting things in the sky and the universe. Um, and who's at the forefront also of examining the position of women in science. And the bios that indicate that Gita is a sociologist with a focus on women's studies and on feminist studies in science. Both of these bios are more extensively available on the website of the BIC, and you can read about their most interesting trajectories. For me, it has been a privilege, it is a privilege to be here with these two academics, these two women, these two people who are seriously committed to examining the place of women and other non-binary genders in science. Science, in the early days had been projected and perhaps was once honestly believed to be an area of creative thinking and activity that was one of the most neutral, non-region, non-gender, non-class specific, a truly merit-based bastion in academics. But of course, we've all come to realize, and I think quite soon it became evident that this was not true. Many of you may be too young to know uh, the book uh, by Watson, of Watson and Crick, of the DNA, on the very unjust way in which Rosalind Franklin, for example, was treated way back in the 50s. And I think over the years, it's become very clear that uh, it's not true that science is this equitable space. It hasn't really needed a deep investigation for the layperson, because just by looking at the numbers, you know that it's not an equitable space that indeed many of the injustices and disparities that pervade society, different societies, not just ours, but also the many societies in India, also impact the scientific community. But the thing that's interesting is that the problems run deeper and are indeed, there are problems that are specific to science. And we are here today to get a handle on gender problems specific to science, in particular, though not solely confined to physics, and also to look at ways these problems are being addressed by the state and by institutions, and the issues that continue to toxify what should be an equal playing field. My name is Indira Chandrasekhar, and maybe what qualifies me to be in this conversation is the fact that I worked in science, I was a biophysicist for many years, in labs the world over, but now I write fiction, and at the core of my fiction is a subtle examination of the way in which women negotiate societal space. So I think this is what brings me into this conversation. But I have to say that my understanding, and it really has been a privilege, my understanding and my appreciation of the larger implications that frame and impact what we will embark on discussing in the next few minutes, not just their larger implications, but also the more specific manifestations. The, my understanding of all of that has, been, has evolved and developed through my preparatory conversations with Prajwal and Gita that have been rich and full of discussion and debate. And I'm certain that you too will feel the same way. And in order to capture the, capture the essence of those very interesting conversations, We've decided to allow this to be a, quite a responsive, freewheeling conversation, um, structured, of course, but somehow allowing various um, sort of um, detours and discussions. So I think I'm going to start by asking Prajwal to frame some of the issues, um, some of the facts, some of the statistics that uh, are the evidence that point to the number of women in science, in physics in particular, and when does the pyramid, you know, the falling off of women in this trajectory of science begin to emerge? And is, you know, many questions around the pyramid, we'll get to them. Perhaps also you can just start in a little bit by telling the audience, especially since we have so many young people in the audience, uh, what you do in science so that, you know, they can get a, some contextualization. 
Uh, thanks. Thanks a lot. And it's uh, a real pleasure to be here with very old friends, but also an honor to be at a program here and discuss uh, this issue, uh, which might sound a bit esoteric because if we look at society around us, you know, gender inequity within sciences is not the most pressing of problems. But I think uh, there are good reasons uh, for everyone uh, to get their heads around it. Um, so I, uh, as Indira said, uh, I'm an astrophysicist. I uh, study uh, black holes, uh, which we know uh, exist in the centers of very far away galaxies. And uh, we try to see how we can understand what happens with them using the laws of physics we infer on Earth. Um, and part of what facilitates that is some of these black holes become beacons in the sky, and we look at that, look at them, and um, carry out our investigations. So, uh, to come back to the inequity question, um, it is true that uh, uh, even a layperson can see right away that there are there is not a uniformity of numbers if you take the gender binary within science. But uh, what is very common is to see that as a disparity, uh, not necessarily an inequity. So if you uh, ask a typical scientist, I think they would say, yes, there is a disparity, uh, but that is because of things that happen in outside society. And within a science, there is no inequity. Uh, within science, there is no bias. We are objective, we are neutral, and so on. We are a meritocracy, uh, basically. So just to look at the raw numbers, um, all over the world, uh, there is, of course, a disparity in numbers. Uh, the number of uh, women versus men uh, in science decreases as you increase the level from the undergraduate to the master's to the... A PhD and then faculty. Mm, and uh, so this is called the leaky pipeline uh, very often in the literature. If you look at the numbers in India, uh, they might be similar depending on the context. But if you actually look at PhDs in science in India who have, been, uh, who have jobs in higher education, then uh, the numbers are fairly matched. Uh, so in, as of 2015, it was 45% as per the statistics from the UGC. But uh, if you look at the different kinds of institutions in India, so in India in science especially, uh, the institutions in, uh, in Indian science are stratified. So you have, you have the colleges which teach science, of course, you have the universities which have postgraduate pro programs in science, and then you have these special research institutions, which are regarded as elite institutions. They get better funding. Um, they are supposed to be uh, sort of at the vanguard of excellence uh, in science research. So if you go along this stratification, the gender fraction uh, worsens quite fast. So in the elite institutions, which you would think are actually, if they're institutions of excellence, they should be at, you know, sort of modern, forward-looking, uh, with the best institutional culture and so on, they have the worst uh, gender disparity. So then if you, uh, so, so in, if, you, if you just take the raw numbers and look at this echelon and talk about the leaky pipeline, uh, the explanation that comes uh, to most people's minds is that women, uh, there is attrition of women because they have to um, shoulder the discriminatory societal expectations, the discriminatory familial responsibilities, and therefore there is attrition. Uh, however, the, uh, the evidence does not quite point to that. And uh, uh, 
Uh, there is, of course, the other trope that girls are not attracted to science. Again, in the Indian numbers, the evidence doesn't point to that. So if you look at national Inspire fellowships, for example, which some of you may know about, which gives you a fellowship after some sort of fairly uh, competitive uh, pr process, uh, gives you a fellowship to study science and BSc and MSc. Those uh, are won by more girls than boys, and in physics, they are equal. Uh, physics, by the way, is the worst of the disciplines in terms of this disparity all over the world. Uh, so in physics, they are equal. Similarly, with the Indian Academy, uh, science, uh, summer science fellowships uh, here, right here in Bengaluru, uh, and so on. Um, and so there is no evidence that girls lack uh, an interest in science. And uh, if you also look at the numbers somewhat deeply, uh, the, the idea that it is simply attrition because women shoulder extra responsibility also is not uh, borne out. So I can go a little bit more into that. Mm. Thank you, Prajbal. That's I think uh, sets up a, a, really well what we are sort of going to be addressing. So, Geeta, I I think that um, maybe uh, is this a good moment to sort of try to understand um, your first of all what feminist studies in science are a little bit, and also maybe to sort of understand why this is not just the societal pressures that women face that are uh, you know causing this these. Uh, uh, huge divide in the numbers. Um, but um, um, so just give us your take on it and, and, and the way in which science is even dealt with. And, you know, at this point, I think after Gita speaks, we'll just um, leap in at any moment and start to. <laughs> uh, so hello, everyone. And thank you, Indira. And lovely to be in a conversation at BIC with Prajwal. And um, so uh, firstly, uh, as a sociologist, uh, the stars we study and the black holes we look at are us, as people, as societies, groups, cultures. Yeah. So um, methodologically, we are supposed to uh, be scientific, uh, much fashioned in the way the natural sciences, you know, practice the scientific method, and yet our understanding of science is also different. So when we look at uh, society of which we are a part, uh, it's a very interesting uh, oeuvre that we need to make to uh, get uh, so-called objective knowledge, okay? So as a sociologist, when I'm looking at science, so let's say till the 1960s, uh, a lot of sociology looked at science uh, again in very, very uh, esoteric ways, uh, privileging science as a special institution of knowledge making because of its method as being apolitical, ahistorical, asocial. In the 60s, with the work of somebody called Thomas Kuhn, some of you might know, uh, the this, this way of looking at science definitely changed, and in the 1970s, it changed even further. Kuhn, of course, argued, saying that scientific knowledge progresses with because of the consensus that the scientific community builds around a theory or a paradigm, rather than through a linear uh, fact evidence kind of uh, uh, method. David Blue went further and said scientific knowledge itself could show us, because as sociologists, as a good sociologist, the expectation is that we should look for social causes and social determinants of anything that we encounter. Not in a reductionist manner, not to reduce everything to the social, but to look at the social dimension. So what are the social dimensions, say, of scientific knowledge, say, of evolution theory, or whatever, you know, different kinds of uh, claims of uh, scientific theories. So we started looking at finding the determinants, social determinants. Now as a feminist sociologist who looks at science, uh, first thing we needed to do as I was saying and as Prajwal pointed out also, is to deflect methodologically, stop looking at say the question of disparity or inequity in science, not only on the basis of gender, but on the basis of caste, on the basis of sexuality, ethnicity, race, in a global context. So how do we explain this phenomenon? 
this disparity. So, as Prajwal said, the conventional way of doing that was to look at societal reasons. Yeah. And so sciences or scientific institutions, cultures of science were absolved of uh, any responsibility of it because of this whole idea that, you know, scientific community is uh, neutral, objective, etc., etc., so on and so forth. So the idea of trying to shift the focus on science, scientific institutions, scientific cultures, to ask the question, what is wrong, what is, what is wrong with science? Why is it becoming the, um, you know, why is it so gated? Why is it become such a, uh, uh, why do only some people get to do science? So uh, to look, put the spotlight on science and scientific institutions, that's one shift that we made because if we don't do that, what happens is that I, and today what the scientific community does, though the lay people know that there's a disparity, the scientific community continues to hold very largely that we are not responsible still for this, right? That either it is society, and since we are now challenging that, saying that it's not entirely society because you are a part of society and you are also responsible for it, what is happening, which is uh, a bit uh, disturbing, is then the argument goes to ability, women's ability. So if it is not society, then you have to find another argument and that argument becomes about women's ability to do science. And therefore, inability. So if they are not there, that means they are not able or they are not able to cope, they are not able to do a certain science, etc, etc. So I wanted to be attentive to this, that what mode of explanation do you want to seek for answering this question of disparity? Yeah. Second point I wanted to make was that, so as feminist science studies, what we tend to do is we look at science, the question of low numbers, but we connect it to the culture of science rather than to innate ability of women or to social causes. Yeah, We try to look at science. That's one thing we do. The other thing I wanted to point out, since we're talking about physics and gradual pointed out that there are very few numbers in physics. Does anybody have an answer for that? Do, what do you think is, is the answer? Interestingly, you find a large number of women in biology. You find a large number of women also in mathematics in India, actually, but very few in physics and even fewer in theoretical physics. So there's a combination of reasons. The, when we look at these disciplines, the sciences themselves, they are also gendered in the way they are practiced, thought about. So physics, because perhaps it is much more abstract and much more uh, uh, privileged in the public discourse, yeah, physics is probably one of the more important disciplines that was involved in defense, in nuclear, uh, ish, you know, um, working with governments and all that historically. It gained a very interesting sort of a hardening, what we call the hardening. One, because it's very fact-based, very abstract, etc., etc. So women are, and you know, the popular understanding or the social and uh, the, the stereotypical understanding is women are not good at that. They better do biology because it's closer to nature. You know, they give birth, so they should study the body. Yeah. So these kind of stereotypes associated with the disciplines is what we must also examine. So in that sense, physics is a very uh, hardened uh, uh, science as opposed to say a biology or a chemistry, yeah? So probably that is also the reason why women are not seen so easily in physics. So, um, so this whole question of, another thing that I just wanted to say before I hand over to also Prajwal is this question of numbers, you know? So we tend to think that numbers will tell us the truth. So, Are, but what is there? 48% are there, no women. What are you all cribbing about? You know, we are doing much better than the rest of the world, which we are perhaps in terms of numbers. But when you look at these num women who are occupying these places in numbers, and you ask them about their experiences of being in science, 
it's very interesting how they speak about discrimination and disparity yeah though the numbers indicate to us that they're it's all it's going well but actually the experience of the women who are in there tells us it's not all that well yeah so for example this whole argument about societal responsibility there are lots of women in science who are single who choose not to uh, perform very feminine roles of you know whatever mm, getting married and having children and all of that they also face discrimination it's not definitely because of their social responsibility something is happening in science why don't they rise to where they have to rise and then the narratives will tell you that if we have to rise where we have to rise you know get the awards get the positions the kind of things that we have to do don't come to us very easily that you know if only we play the game the very very masculine game only then do we get the success so a lot of women are unable to do that yeah and or some of them would choose not to do that yeah so that is also a thing that we need to look at when we are talking about numbers and not becoming complacent and saying oh the numbers are so good so what you are bring about yeah so with that mm. maybe thank you for that yeah. um i just wanted to point out i mean the this uh, conversation about physics and uh, biology uh, and nature i mean what could be more profound and intriguing and mysterious and ununderstood Uh, than life and uh, reproduction you know so i mean to sort of push it away as a soft science uh, yes <laughs> yeah i wondered whether this was a good moment to just say governments have recognized this is this a good moment to sort of address what the government has done to address these issues and why these are reinforcing patriarchal norms in some way yeah Yeah so uh, in India at least there has been fairly early recognition i remember there were very uh, vocal statements by the minister of science and technology in 2008 i when i give talks i have that in my slide that mm-hmm. we seem to be uh, having a stratification along gender lines within science and so on but uh, that did result in a lot of funding to uh, things like the department of science and technology which are which is the prime funding agency of science in india to address this uh, problem but when it came to designing interventions and actually implementing them uh, we find um, that they are really steeped in patriarchy so this whole thing that uh, geeta said about how um there isn't an acknowledgement within science that there is inequity so that's the thing scientists agree with disparity they have to because the numbers say that but that's not due to inequity within science so uh, then why is it so then it is due to this extra um, responsibility that uh, society puts on women so then we just help them negotiate that responsibility so things like oh, flexible work times uh for women for example this is an idea that luckily hasn't been implemented but it has been talked a lot so uh but the way i see it is that you know you're you're just you're just perpetrating the status quo by saying you still have to cook and clean but we'll allow you to come a bit late for work uh you know uh, yes. and uh what the dst actually implemented was something called the career bla- break fellowship so this was something that they gave a three year fellowship to women who could demonstrate that they had taken a career break due to family reasons and they had to find a host institution and then they were funded with salary with research costs to build a lab and so on for three years mm-hmm. now um I remember having a conversation with the secretary of the DST many years ago saying why don't you make this open to both men and women because uh, you don't want to perpetuate the idea that only women you know you don't want to perpetuate this societal idea the discriminatory idea and uh, he, so his reaction was no but which men will apply for this career break thing so i said i know at least two personally who would apply okay. so he said no no let's take care of the women first you know they are our priority so we have to take care <laughs> of the women first so you know there isn't this recognition that uh, if you make it open to both men and women then that first of all affirms your 
uh, position as being anti-patriarchal. But it also causes less harm. And mm -hmm. I think it's really important that interventions uh, should be uh, sort of a priori, at least projected to not cause harm. Mm -hmm. uh, now what is happening is uh, the career break fellowship has now been converted into a women's fellowship. Mm -hmm. So it's gone the other way. Yes. And uh, so then, you know, women who apply for regular faculty positions, even if they are good, uh, there's always this thing that there will be some competing men and all that. So institutions want the best of both worlds. They'll uh, give the job to the man and say, why don't you apply for that women's fellowship? You'll get that anyway. Yes. So that's really sort of reinforcing the whole idea that... Uh, the, the the very thing that you talked about as well, which is that women are, um, you know, have this other role to play and must fulfill it. Um, I, I'm sort of torn between leaping into two conversations, uh, two uh, parts of our strands of this conversation at this point, because one of the things you brought up was uh, the atmosphere uh, of women in science, you know, people who are in science, that 48%, um, they tell you, but it's not all what you wish it to be. So I'm very, uh, I do want to sort of address that that idea and the atmosphere and then, you know, even extend it to the, uh, the, to the Me Too and uh, sexual harassment in the workplace. And then I also want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the whole idea that you brought up, which is that, you know, men need to be pampered in order to, to uh, perform so fantastically in science. And uh, that's something we need to support. So I don't know which one you want to leap into really at this point. <laughs> But uh, yeah. yeah, so I'll try to uh, sort of uh, say that, you know, all these plans that the government uh, states make are often for uh, women in science. And we keep wondering what happens to women in social science. You know? <laughs> its assumption is that, you know, the social science anyway is populated with women, which is again also not really true. So uh, some of us in the social sciences feel that, you know, a lot of it goes to women in science, nothing comes to us, but that's a different story. Uh, but this whole idea that, um, you know, st so, so let me jump into this, for example, uh, taking up from what uh, Prajwal is saying, if you look at some of the laws, like you look at the sexual harassment law, for instance, you know, uh, we were a part of a, a conversation of trying to apply the sexual harassment, the Posh Act, uh, in in uh, different institutions and uh, of of higher education. And one thing that we noticed is that um, stu the Posh Act is for employer and employees, right? But when it comes to the UGC, uh, the UGC regulations, it's for higher education institutions. So the student comes in. Now the student is, is the student gender specific or gender neutral as a concept was a big part of the whole discussion. So we were trying to say though, let's make the student gender neutral in the sense that uh, let the student uh, complainant be both, could be a girl or a boy, you know, man or a woman. And I was told, but how can you, you're a feminist and how are you doing this? So we were like, uh, whoever said that feminists are talking only about women. We are talking about sexual harassment. So sexual harassment, does it happen to men, student, young student boys or no? So of course the logic was, oh yeah, yeah, you know, women also harass students. So we were like, no, could you show us cases where women professors have harassed male students? You won't find statistics. So they were a bit appalled, ki, what are you talking about then? So what we tried to show them is that in a boys' hostel or uh, boys who come from gender non-conforming locations or younger boys are often targeted. And there's a lot of sexual abuse and sexual harassment of boys on campuses. It's not done by women, but it's done by other men. Yeah. So can we not try to bring the boys into the domain of this, yeah? So but specific to science, uh, one of the things that we noticed, which we've been talking about in the Prajwal and I, is that during the hashtag MeToo movement, uh, I kept following it and I, because my work was in the scientific community among scientists, I knew that there was a huge presence 
of not just gender discrimination, not just bias, sexism, misogyny, but of active sexual harassment. But in the hashtag MeToo movement, not a single, for a very long time, not a single uh, male scientist was named either by girls or by boys or whoever. Male scientists were not named. And we were very curious about this. Why is, why is this happening? So apart from the whole problem of not getting recommendation letters, not getting uh, 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 access to uh, jobs and things like that in the future, if you have sort of made a complaint for being stigmatized for doing that, apart from all that, we found a very interesting thing in science, which is that young women told us that in the laboratory, for example, if they worked for four years and then they suddenly, uh, uh, they, they experience sexual harassment, they might have been experiencing it for a while or it might happen the first time and they want to complain, but they realize that if they do complain, they lose their control and access over the work that they have done. That is a very huge and important point. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the we keep putting the onus on the women. Oh, why didn't she complain? If it was so bad, why didn't she complain? She should have complained. You know, the onus is entirely on the girl. But the <coughs> point is there are no support structures in institutions. Maybe uh, you should mention the dis difference for a social scientist. Yeah, for see, for example, in the social sciences and what is called the arts, um, if you do file a, a complaint against your supervisor at some point, yeah, all those things will happen, your recommendation letters, etc., all that will happen. But you don't lose control over your work. You take your work to the next supervisor and maybe the next supervisor, if it's in the same area of work, will do it. Here, that doesn't happen. So that becomes, so that is something we need to look at and see how that can be uh, reworked. And the other thing is, uh, you know, coming to the one more point that Indira raised about this 48% that is there, I mean, uh, of women, the earlier generation of women in science, not Prajwal's, a generation earlier, would still buy the same logic that no, 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 science is not discriminating. Mm -hmm. You know, if the problem lies with me, mm -hmm. the problem lies with the society that I come from. I think with Prajwal's generation, that has changed. Women in science have begun to recognize that there is a lot of discrimination that you can say happens because of the culture of science and scientists themselves. And this organization of the women in science will probably help to develop support groups for students who have been facing sexual harassment, for example. Yes. Because the ICs are supposed to have women as uh, presiding officers. If we sensitize them, hopefully they will see better. But instead, what is happening all the time, and some of you will know, that if you take a complaint to a presiding officer, very often it's the woman who will say, no, no, keep quiet, let it be. Why do you want to ruin your career? Okay. You know, stay quiet. Mm -hmm. So this 48% of women or in institution or entering into science, I feel has a role to play, but the entire onus of it needn't fall on uh, the women alone, as uh, Prajwal was saying, we need a rethink in the entire institutional cultures, mm -hmm. you know, which are still very deeply patriarchal, even in the women, yes. you know, even the women can yes. be extremely yes. patriarchal. I uh, just to sort of thank you for that. That was really important uh, to raise and uh, elaborate on. And um, I, and I'm just sort of thinking, uh, you know, staying with the idea of the atmosphere for women in science. I we uh, having a sort of a, a, a conversation about oh meeting today and um, and then Prajwal raised something which deeply shocked me actually, uh, uh, which was if if you don't mind my talking about it. Um, you know, Prajwal and I have known each other for many years. And uh, we were, in fact, uh, once in a lab where some very unpleasant things happened. And she was like a absolute pillar of, uh, 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 you know, holding uh, holding steady in terms of support, uh, support and uh, staying the course in terms of standing by another woman in the in the lab. And so I've always uh, felt that uh, she has uh, she was on top of it, you know. And then she said to me, it's very interesting, the atmosphere in a scientific laboratory where you're surrounded by a number of men in, in, in a physics laboratory, 
you think about how you dress and you don't wear, uh, she said, for example, I hesitate wearing a sari because it immediately then puts a mark on you as being, um, um, well, elaborate on that. And, <laughs> and so, I mean, and I don't want to dwell on that necessarily, but I'm just saying the atmosphere of toxicity in a way is so interesting and all pervasive and hits you in ways you don't anticipate, right? Yeah. So the whole, the idea of performance then becomes of, of well, I won't get into that. I think that's a whole other conversation, uh, becomes um, something you really think about very deeply. You're not just now thinking about yourself and who you are when you get dressed in the morning. You're thinking about where you're going to be and what is what are you going to be perceived as, right? And that's very oppressive, actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it. I think uh, uh, I realized. I think when I got into my master's degree, so I, until until college, I wasn't conscious that, for example, there was this inequity in science because, of course, I saw inequity, gender inequity, all around. But it so happened that I went to a girls' school, a girls' college. In my girls' school, uh, the only men teachers were for music and Kannada and. Uh, all my other teachers, including physics, in, you know, games and NCC, and of course science and maths and everything, were women. In college, they were mixed. Uh, in college, also, uh, you know, two of my um, one math professor and physics professor were Roman Catholic nuns. The only PhD in physics, in in fact, all of science, was a woman. Uh, and so on. There were men as well, but it was a mix. So when I went to IIT for my MSc is when I started to sort of really become conscious of the gender inequity within science. So until then, I was also in this bubble that science is different. Science is, you know, education is different. Science is different. So uh, you become very, uh, so as it is, because you're one of a minority, you know, you uh, you tend to attract attention, which is what really hits you. And you realize that you are seen as a woman first. I mean, you're not seen as a person passionate about science or somebody who's interested in music or, you know, uh, somebody who plays football well or, you know, none of these things which may be part of you seem to be foregrounded even within a science institute. So then like wearing a sari seems to just, you know, reinforce that. <laughs> so many times so there is this decision yeah I mean yeah I can say I I don't do it in uh, professional so today I'm wearing a sari <laughs> <laughs> so, setting so it's like you know what you were saying about you know uh, this discriminatory familial responsibility being the yeah. sort of overarching thing but so I think so first of all the evidence does not support that. What the uh, evidence shows is that that may play some role in attrition, but there has been this very, I mean, there are not too many studies, but this one study with Anita Kurup and uh, collaborators did showed that, uh, first of all, if you look at number of hours mm -hmm. that uh, women spend, there's not that much of a difference between, you know, women scientists and men scientists. If you look at uh, the views, the perceptions of why there is a disparity of numbers, then both the women and the men who are in science, who are practicing scientists, both felt it was this discriminatory familial responsibility, but, it, but they also talked to women who were PhDs, but who were not in science. Mm. And they said it was not because of that. It was because they didn't get jobs. And, you know, this is a very common thing that even if it is illegal to uh, discriminate on the basis of your marital status mm -hmm. and take into consideration your marital status when you hire, mm -hmm. a lot of scientific institutions do that. It's an unwritten rule. Mm -hmm. So many women who have spouses who are hired as faculty mm -hmm. will not get a job in that institution. And some of them are openly told this, oh. but not on paper. Right. The advertisement will never say yeah, yes. that if you're married to uh, you know, a scientist, you will not be considered. And it's an untenable requirement anyway, because mm -hmm. if two people are hired and then they decide to get married, they're not going to hire, fire one of them. Yes. So it's an untenable, sort of, but it, it exists even mm -hmm. today. Yeah. Even people now applying for jobs face this. So 
So the fact that you're a woman is just foregrounded and it, it sort of drowns every other part of you as a person yes. uh, in science. Yes. So on the performance, if I may. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. So on the performance uh, issue. Maybe um, we can sort of elaborate on what, what we mean by the performance. Yeah, yes. yeah. So uh, the body performance, for example, um, uh, all of us in the academic world or all of us as sociologists, I can tell you that body is a sign, sign on site on which culture is written, right? So your caste, the way you dress, your class, your, um, you know, even your gender identity, you express it through the body, through the way you dress. So to a large extent, there is a naturalness to it. There is a social component to it. But what I, uh, uh, so in the academics, of course, there is always this thing about how academics should dress, men and women, yeah? So uh, there's, there's a certain um, yeah, expectation and a convention, which you all tend to follow. But what happens in the case of women is that, what Prajwal was saying that, uh, you are expected to perform not the identity of the professional academic, but the identity of the woman, woman professional academic. Yeah, so it happens everywhere. But what I did notice in the sciences through my own work, where through discussions and conversations and interviews, women in science face a very peculiar problem. You know, because science is so masculinized. And it is so far away from the social women. Women in science feel a lot of the pressure to uh, what we may call defeminize themselves in order to take that to be taken seriously. So, for example, if you um, you know are wearing a slightly um, you know a nice salwar kameez or a nice sari or a nice skirt. And you go for a presentation for your paper, you are looked at as superficial and as frivolous. So you don't do that. Yeah. So you don't want to be very austere and very serious and things like that. On the other hand, when they have to work within the world out of science, then they have a very special need to underline their femininity. Because if you're a woman scientist, then somehow you're looked at as an oddity. You're somebody odd. So they're negotiating that. And very often you'll see a lot of women in science. See all the ISRO images that you have. Yeah, All of them there, of course, it's much more organic. But a lot of them will present themselves with Mangal Sutras, with all the signs of marriage, with the proper saris and all that. Saying that we are scientists, but we are also women. I don't know whether I'm being able to express to you the complexity of a woman in science and what, what she goes through in her uh, body performance. So um, there's an anecdote which is there in our volumes, if you want to look at it, which has been, uh, which Vidita Vedya talks about. And she speaks about how she herself as a woman biologist has to undergo a lot of change in her own thinking despite the fact that she says that in her lab she allow, allows, no, that's the wrong word, people are free to dress well, happily, the way they wish to, with less pressures from how they're expected to dress. Even then she says for one of the conferences, one of her female students said, I want to present in a pink poster. You know, my poster presentation in the color pink. And she talks about it. She, she says that I was like, no, you can't present a pink poster. So the student said, but why not? She said, no, they won't take you seriously. And this is, she's saying that me being myself still had to go through this. And then she had to turn around and say, yeah, go ahead, but present a pink poster. Yeah. So, uh, I urge you to go and look at this little video that the European Union produced on, which is, of course, is highly debated. I won't get into the debate here, where they tried to, you know, women actually will, the, 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 uh, science was becoming less popular globally. Everybody was moving into the corporate. So the European Union wanted to attract girls because men were giving away, giving up science. They wanted to bring the girls in. So they introduced a video. Have you seen it? Science, it's a girl thing. 
it's a three and a half minute video it's so funny and the kind of reactions that the whole scientific community women particularly had was very interesting because in this science is the girl is shown to be doing makeup wearing high heels this that you know fashionista and is very deeply interested in science so the the discourse around it became women in science said this is trivializing science and feminists said this is trivializing uh, you know gender equity issues because you're showing reproducing stereotypes and all of that but it's great fun have a look at it so yeah the issue of uh, body performance for the women in science is actually a very very complex terrain so i kind of feel what uh, what what prajwal is saying to when she said you know i don't want to wear a sari and doll up myself for example in an academic conference i mean i do the same thing now even in uh, sociology conferences you know because it's too performative mm -hmm. the sari is too performative and it's a very very upper caste uh, sort of a thing you know ah. to certain kind of sorry <laughs> sorry to say sorry i didn't mean that Not. I mean, it's a good point. Uh, fairly well taken. Uh, we actually there are so many other things we we could continue to talk about. And I think one of the things we had said we would like to bring up is this idea of what is meritocracy, what is measure of success, and so on. But I see that we have uh, uh, some time. Uh, I mean, we don't have that much time, so it's there's a lot more we can talk about because what we've talked about are the issues, but what are the ways in which we can address the issues is a very important discussion. But um, and uh, that's what both Prajwal and Geeta have, uh, in fact, um, spent a lot of time considering and reflecting upon, and that's important because it's all very well to say these are issues and problems. How do we address them? But I do want to open up uh, to the audience. So, if anyone has any questions, uh, do feel free to ask. Raise your hands. There'll be a mic that'll come around. And um, if you're still, if you're feeling sort of uncertain about asking a question, just sort of gear up your courage and and ask. And uh, we'll give them a minute or two. And if not, maybe we can address the meritocracy and a success measure ish conversation. Yes. Yeah. Uh. So sh shall we just leap into it? Are there any questions? Oh, there are. There are a couple. So why don't we let questions come and then maybe we can just get to them. Hi, good evening. My name is Gopinath. Um, Hold the mic close so we can hear. My voice is a bit low. Sorry. Uh, I think most of this uh, majority of the minds, mindset is is in the undergraduate courses. Um, where the gender segregation happens there, uh, predominantly it is due to the family background, the economic status of the family, then their uh, performances. Uh, mostly they go into this um, commerce thing uh, because post graduation it's very easy to get jobs. They say it is more versatile. Yeah. So, then, would, shall shall we allow the uh, panelists to respond to that and uh, respond to that idea just, that? Just yeah. Half okay. A second, yeah. Half sorry. Minute. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, then what happens is then the meritocracy comes in when the elite who gets a higher mark gets into the engineering or medicine. A fallout of that is science, commerce, and that the most filtered is arts. Uh, Uh, with within the scientific community, the science section, why should gender matter? Does does it dilute the science uh, thing in it? Um, so I think in a way we talked. That's what we talked about. But I'll let you both respond, perhaps. Yeah. So uh, I I'm not sure I understood the question. So. Uh, are you asking why gender matters? Yeah, why should gender matter? When yeah, so that's the question the I also community. ask. Why should gender matter? Uh, it should not matter because science is a human pursuit, and uh, women are people. Uh, so, uh, in fact, I'm reminded of uh, Evelyn Fox Keller, who once said in her talk that if you start a sentence with "women are." The only way you can end it is by saying people. So women are people uh, like everyone else. So this sh it should not matter. But the numbers 
first of all, show us that it does matter. And if we dig deeper into the numbers, for example, what I said about how the gender disparity in India in higher education uh, gets much worse when you go to elite science institutions. Uh, and also, if you look at this common idea that girls are not attracted to science, but that is again contradicted by the numbers that girls very much uh, do very well in terms of the National Inspire Fellowships or the Indian Academy of Science Summer Fellowships and so on. Uh, so then there is something else. Uh, the fact that there are very, uh, there are much fewer numbers of women in physics compared to biology also contra you know, contravenes this idea that this disparity is only because of the social expectations on, on women, because why should, you know, biologists have uh, less household responsibilities, uh, right? So, uh, so that is the question, in, in fact, that we're asking, that gender does matter. And then we have to look at what are these modes of exclusion within science, which result in the disparity. So uh, one of the things I think that happens is that when uh, scientists, whether men or women, uh, look at why this happens, uh, instead of looking at the numbers, they, they sort of see what happens, what is very visible to them through the lens, not of a scientist who looks at evidence, but through the lens of what they've been brought up in, which is a patriarchal lens. And so when, I, when they look at me, say, um, in the scientific space, whether it's men or women, it doesn't matter, they look at me uh, more as a woman rather than as a scientist. And therefore, they see my performance, they, they assume that me as a knower, uh, I will be impacted by my social location, which is being a woman. So they don't, I mean, it doesn't matter whether actually, you know, I'm bearing extra responsibility. I know I may have a spouse who's actually a homemaker and, you know, who allows, who sort of has, you know, uh, mandated me to do my work 60 hours a week in science. All that doesn't matter. Just by identifying me as somebody from that social location, namely of a woman, they assume that my knowing will be affected by that. So they assume that my science will be less competent. They assume that I will not be able to, you know, fulfill all the respons institutional responsibilities like attending meetings or traveling to conferences or, you know, all of that. So these are all assumed. And then they go several steps ahead saying, that then means that this is sort of nature given, that it is to do with the genes, and then, you know, it's just wrong. So, so then all the interventions are sort of seem to be informed by that. So the interventions also become patriarchal. So, if I'm, uh, so I'll try to, I, I'll try to answer it a little differently and to say that, uh, whom does it matter to gender matters? Uh, I think gender matters. And it matters in two ways. One is that as if as a social social scientist, I see that a particular domain, there are many, many more men occupying that domain than say women. And these men are all largely upper caste men. And there are very few women, men from other castes or from a dominant religious group. Now that becomes an interesting question for me to explore because I will not buy the answer that it is the biological genetic uh, ability of these communities, which is the reason why they are there where they are there. Right? So if I were to ask the question differently and say, I'm not looking at the genetic part or the biological part because that's not my job. I'm a sociologist. I want to look at the social causes or reasons. When I start doing that, I realize, obviously, that it is the so-called esoteric science, which is supposed to be outside of society, is actually deeply embedded and is very, very patriarchal, as Prajul is telling you. And then I find my explanation and say, ah, ah, gender matters. Right? It seems to be that gender matters. So I have to take cognizance of that. And then I have to ask the question, how does it matter? 
why does it matter how do we change this mattering yeah and i might be pushing something right now with the permission of uh, indra but i would also go to the extent of saying that if you have say more diverse groups in science okay whether it's gender or caste or ethnicity or whatever you probably do a different kind of a science you'll probably do a probably a less aggressive less competitive less less invasive kind of science i don't want to give up on that possibility so in that sense also gender matters yeah so i don't know whether that answers your question i didn't quite understand the art science commerce yeah these are streams they get streamed particularly according to caste in our cultures they get particularly streamed according to gender and all that happens but i hope this answers your question i uh, remember i i forgot if he uh, talked about this in, in his book or like at, in a, in a, in a, in one of his talks but like i remember ben barrels uh, uh he, he he's a uh, trans man and and an amazing neuroscientist yeah, ben barrels yes I, 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 uh, I, i remember him saying somewhere uh, about uh, post transitioning uh, someone uh, like uh, referred to his uh, the, his dead name and like uh, like uh, like this is the same person and um uh, like is this your sister yeah. like your is this person your sister because like your work is much better than yeah. like i'm not like is uh, saying uh, in, uh, i'm not saying that in the exact words that ben did but like uh, i i i think uh, i think like this is really good like i was like remembering uh, ben yeah uh, absolutely because while it is patriarchal what you're saying is also it's extremely Uh, like most of our institutions extremely heteronormative extremely homophobic so ben baris's case is a proper case which will tell you what gender matters because ben baris was barbara baris and after transitioning uh, he wrote a paper you must all read it for nature where he uh, talks about how he himself was trying and he deals with very complex issues of whether it really has something to do with my biology after i've become male has my ability to do mathematics really changed all of that he speaks about it in very complex manner but for the moment he let me just uh, uh, say what abby was saying is that the standard reaction that he was getting was that oh you know you have a sister called barbara baris but your works is be- much better than hers so he says this is <laughs> living example and just once again very quickly i'll just give the example of tim hunt controversy all of you all probably know about it that's again how gender matters and where it matters where tim hunt said that you should have gender segregated laboratories women should be in separate laboratories men should be in separate laboratories why he joked because women fall in love then they cry <laughs> then they, they damages the work of science so chinik and i had once made a presentation on saying so why are scientists so scared of love and emotion and crying that also reflects a lot on the masculine culture of science right it is deeply deeply masculine there's no place for in that sense of emotion there's place for sexual harassment but there's no place for love <laughs> thank you for being there oh there's a question Yeah. hello ma'am my name is aman hello everyone ma'am uh, uh, you have mentioned that you know uh, uh, there was a uh, there was a, there was a uh, women and you have said that um, whether it is a, uh, an academician women or women academician so i really want to understand that uh, whenever we are in a particular situation how our personality splits which identity we choose as a women as an academician and how things get to super superimposed so i really want to understand that in this particular discourse discourse that you have been talking one thing and the second thing is uh, you know uh, uh, what is the idea of equality when people are born into the what is the idea of equality when uh, and why do we need it 
when uh, we are born uh, different into the different social status into the different you know uh, uh, we have a different upbringing uh, so the question should be you know like uh, how can we make this society more beautiful like uh, uh, um, uh, for the matter of course you can uh, take an example that you know uh, some women can be good in something so instead of encouraging that why are we into the uh, like uh, why are we so reluctant that you know we should want equality uh, uh, so the idea should be uh, I, I'm, I, yeah I, I, i mean uh, equality is for uh, equals not for unequals right and everybody is born unequal <laughs> french will you want to go first no you go <laughs> now you know so you really I, shake I, I, up yes. I, I, no no i'm glad you feel comfortable and safe enough to ask that uh, because generally we would uh, probably frighten away people and not make them up. so anyway so um, on the first question on academic identities and our uh, identity as as women uh, they are very well integrated in our minds i would say as practitioners academics uh, i don't think we live in that split that oh i'm an academic or i'm a woman it comes most organically naturally you know but i think in the context and if you've heard prajwal say things very carefully you will see that you're made to become conscious of the fact that you know you are different you're not the same as say a male academic whose identity and his integration is taken for granted it's normalized right for us there's no split as far as uh, uh, we can see we are academics we are women yeah uh, there is a wider culture of academics which affects all men and women but there is a specificity with which we as women are uh, we face and we have to tackle that and it is not something that comes from us it comes from the context in which we operate so if for example in my context i can tell you very often uh, uh if of course things are changing but if you are interested in theory uh very often women in theory are looked at as odd because women in sociology should be doing more things like family studies marriage studies child development you know uh, maybe religion but you're doing actually sociological theory there's a little uh, how can you know you're a woman type so we face that now on this other thing about equality um, i mean i'm going to let prajwal before, take that more uh, before you talk about equality uh, i should also say that similar to that what you just said about sociology and you know women should do family studies i have seen in physics uh, when people mentor Uh, if they mentor young women very differently from mentoring young men so for example they will tell young women uh, maybe you can take uh, you know numerical simulations yes. Less as question. your area because then you know I, i don't know if you know this but numerical simulations is a way of simulating physical situations in the computer and they are very typically very intensive so uh, they require a lot of computer resources and also they take a long time to run so you run you you say you i let's say i want to investigate what happens when some charged particles come near a black hole i simulate that whole thing and put it into the computer and it is computer heavy so it'll take about an hour or 2 hours or sometimes even days for it to run so it's like why don't you take computer simulations so then you know you can start your computer and then go take care of your kitchen and your child and all that while the program runs you oh, know that's so this shocking. sort of a thing so uh, it's there yeah. even in physics yeah yeah it's so uh, coming to this question about see a lot of us a, 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 who work for gender equity and other equity forms of equity also uh, we don't work with the assumption that uh, difference equals hierarchy we work with the assumption that if you genuinely want to retain difference and diversity then you cannot operate with the kind of ideologies that we have right now which is that you are different and this is your place and so be there 
yeah that kind of peace that we try to get ki why are you disturbing the balance you know you're a homemaker uh, stay there no it's good for the society if you don't stay at home children will uh, become drug addicts and you know divorces will happen right <laughs> so that is the kind of thing that we we are we are questioning and challenging so um while a lot of people in the women's movement and in uh, other movements of people from the margins uh, we would recognize difference it would be obviously uh, it would be stupid to say that there is no difference particularly on gender yeah but what do you do with that difference how do you understand that the difference why is the difference only on the binary why is it done like this why is the difference not seen on the basis of other things yeah so the question of difference is handled while talking about justice yeah so uh, in fact we are now talking about the fact that we are different and please make place for that difference the problem with the system is that it's not making place for that difference right what if i want to ask very different questions about the human brain yeah is there a particular is there a space for that or human body what if i want to ask the question about that why are we looking at the body as only a sexed body why do we look at female bodies only in terms of their reproductive functions yeah these are all glaring things right so if you really want difference and diversity along with justice then we cannot legitimize what is going on okay uh, just to add on ma'am uh, so that we'll have a better understanding actually i mean support of the differences i'm not uh, i don't support discrimination the idea is that you know uh, instead of taking men and women there are different classes also like upper lower side different uh, academician non academician scientist so i'm just saying that you know we have differences let's just acknowledge it and uh, uh, so if we acknowledge it then there will be no debate of equality Uh, yeah but i think uh, that is an ideal situation but uh, you know it just doesn't happen by us all saying oh you know we all have our differences and let's all be happy together and you know then things that, that that doesn't work like that uh, because partly because there are two things about this equality thing that there is something and by the way all of this i have learned not through my physics training in fact my physics training tells yeah has taught you know it teaches physicists to think they're very brilliant they can understand the whole world so they can explain not only their physics but everything and all of this i have learned from my social science uh, some of them friends whom i know personally uh, and some of them uh, who i don't know personally but i've read about but there is this thing that of defining what is normal and uh, there there has been a tendency to use science to in fact define what is normal so then everything which is different is from that so called normal or ideal or something is going to have a lower status so that is kind of the underlying thing and you see you see that phenomenon even in hard science i mean uh, another friend uh, uh, called chainika sha who got mentioned earlier she's a trained physicist but now uh, doing very interdisciplinary work she has given uh, she showed me the example of boyle's law and how we learn about boyle's law as an ideal gas law and we don't praise place enough emphasis on the fact that most most situations don't observe the ideal gas law situation so it is useful but it is certainly not universal but we behave as if it's universal and then that gets us into trouble so there's something called the ideal and everything else is not ideal so that kind of a sort of a line of thinking pervades everything including what is a normal scientist so a normal scientist is defined in a certain way uh, women or trans people or queer people don't fit that way or even even lower caste people don't fit that and so then they are at some Excellent. yeah they are kind of intruders interlopers maybe we have to make you know make a little accommodation but they're not really so you're really creating margins yeah, you're those creating margins, margins. Yeah, absolutely yeah. so i also want to refer you to how this difference gets uh, 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 expressed and then maybe you'll 
feel the need to problematize it. So the classic work that I want to refer to is the uh, uh, is called The Egg and the Sperm. Some of you might know about it, Emily Martin's work, where she looks at language. The use of language, for example, on uh, in in describing reproduction, for example, and in you see this in uh, textbooks. You see, so where the sperm is uh, projected and presented as being active, and you know the egg is presented as being very passive, right? And the language used is a very deeply gendered language. Yeah. Now this you might say, but this is showing the difference. What is it doing? Is it really showing the difference or is it further typifying and reproducing the kind of social hierarchies that we have, which present the women as passive and men as active? So I'm just trying to say that we need to be very careful by just before we just take this very blasé attitude. You know, there are differences, so live with them. Our job is to actually ask why those differences are becoming the basis for discrimination yes. and why those differences are based in a hierarchical order. That's our job. Not to contest difference and not to say that we're all same and we're going to become same. No, in fact, we would be against that kind of mono uh, culture. Yeah. So I think that's a fine place to end because that is what we want to do. Um, thank you both. Um, really, this was wonderful, and I'm so really. I, I reiterate that I feel privileged that I was part of these wonderful preparatory conversations as well. I, it, it was fantastic to listen to both of you speak, and today I think you've really unpacked the, these questions uh, uh, to an audience that uh, will then hopefully go further and investigate it. And I think you can surely access Prajwal and Geeta at any time and uh, take questions to them if you need to. Thank you both very much. Thank you, BIC Thank you, team. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you.